The first thing anyone studying World War II field operations learns is that soldiers didn't survive brutal winters because they were tougher than us. They survived because they were resourceful. They used methods that didn't require fuel deliveries, electric grids, or modern insulation. And, you know, one of those methods was so reliable, so cost-free, and so brutally effective that modern energy companies would probably prefer most people never rediscover it. It wasn't a heater. It wasn't a tool. It was a principle, an understanding of heat retention, microclimates, and controlled airflow refined on battlefields where failure meant frostbite or death. This guide breaks that method down so cleanly that you can apply it today with nothing more than what you already have at home or in the field. During the war, units stationed in the Ardennes, Karelia and Manchuria had to deal with temperatures that would cripple a modern home if the power went out for a night. Generators were rare, fuel was rationed, and even field stoves couldn't run non-stop. Yet diaries, engineering reports, and post-war field manuals record something fascinating. Many squads stayed warm without burning much of anything. They relied on a heating system built from terrain, structure, and physics. Not technology knowledge. That's the one-minute hook, and after this point we get straight into the real method. The method wasn't a tool, but rather a controlled microclimate system that, well, any soldier could create. When winter hit hard, forward units had to improvise, or honestly, they were done for. The trick they mastered is what historians later described as heat compression sheltering. They didn't use that term during the war, but, you know, documents from Finnish ski troops and German Gebirgsjäger mountain units describe the same principle, shrink the heat loss environment until the smallest heat source becomes effective. This is where, frankly, energy companies would rather you stay uninformed. They profit when you heat a full house. But the World War II method heats a space within a space, and it works so efficiently that even a candle, a small stove, or pure body heat becomes enough. The trick was always the same. Create a pocket where rising warm air cannot escape upward or outward. This is why the warmest soldiers weren't the ones with the biggest fires. They were the ones who built the smartest thermal envelope around themselves. To apply this today, the modern equivalent is setting up a thermal compression zone inside your home during a blackout. Start by choosing the smallest room possible. Block off gaps with blankets, extra clothing or furniture edges. Push heat sources low and maintain only slight airflow so condensation doesn't build. WW3 troops often placed their heat near the floor and slept on raised branches or gear so cold air pooled underneath them instead of on them. You can replicate the principle at home with a camping cot, stacked boxes or even a thick blanket on chairs so your body sits above the cold layer. The second part of the technique relied on a strict airflow pattern borrowed from trench engineering. People assume heat is just about warmth. But two engineers knew it was actually about movement. In many field diaries from Soviet frontline bunkers, a repeated detail appears. Soldiers cut pencil-thin vent channels at the top, and a slightly wider one near the floor. This created a convection loop that trapped warm air but purged smoke, moisture and excess carbon dioxide. In freezing temperatures, even moisture can cause deadly chill inside a shelter and frostbite risk skyrockets. 
Today, you can actually apply this same airflow logic in a blackout by ensuring any enclosed warming zone has a low-level fresh air entry, even just a cracked door and a high-level slow exit, like a tiny window crack or an upper vent. You don't need drafts, you know. What you need is controlled cycle. This keeps oxygen fresh while stopping heat from escaping too fast. It's subtle, but, well, WO2 field notes show that soldiers who understood this airflow stayed warmer with less fuel and, honestly, fewer health complications. Another critical part of the WO2 heating secret was radiant mass, not open flame. One of the biggest misconceptions modern people have about staying warm is believing that a bigger fire equals more heat. W22 didn't allow that. Flames created smoke, gave away position, and burned precious fuel. So troops focused on radiant mass. They heated rocks, bricks, or metal plates with very small flames, then use the stored thermal energy to radiate heat for hours. So, this is where the method becomes something you can, well, directly use today. If the power goes out and you happen to have a small camping stove, or maybe just a candle or an alcohol burner, you can heat up a dense object, like stone tiles, an old cast-iron skillet, fire bricks, really anything heavy. Then just place it safely in your thermal compression zone. The heat release is slow, steady, and, you know, really quite quiet. Finnish troops routinely used heated stones wrapped in wool socks or cloth, placing them under benches or bunks to warm the lower air layer, which then rose gently. That single manoeuvre could raise interior temperatures by 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, even in sub-zero weather. If you want a practical modern example, well, just take a few unglazed ceramic tiles, heat them gently over a candle or stove for about 10 minutes, then move them to your insulated room. You've now created a passive radiant heater that requires almost no fuel at all. Units that mastered thermal compression, controlled airflow and radiant mass didn't just stay alive, they stayed operational. Their shelters maintained warmth overnight, used almost no fuel, and honestly were safer than open fires. When officers wrote after-action reports, these shelters were praised more than rifles or winter coats. They saved lives. For a modern survivalist, combining these principles is actually pretty straightforward. Create a small thermal zone inside a larger room. Seal it intelligently, not suffocatingly. Establish a convection pattern with low intake and a tiny high exhaust. Add a radiant mass heater warm by minimal fuel. Then elevate your sleeping area so the coldest air stays below you. It's everything Tabo 2 soldiers did, but adapted for a living room, cabin or tent. If you want more historically grounded survival knowledge like this, real methods used by people who didn't have the luxury of failure, make sure you subscribe to Warfield Survival and share this video with someone who appreciates serious history the way you do.